Hello, and welcome to the Verification Academy and Session 5 of Advanced UVM, the Proper Care and Feeding of Sequences. I'm Tom Fitzpatrick, Strategic Verification Architect here at Siemens EDA, and this session will show you the mechanics of starting sequences in UVM and the interactions between sequences and drivers. Let's get started. As we saw in the last session, the key to reusability in UVM is to be able to separate behavior from structure. The structure defines the test bench and the components that you need to interact with your DUT. The behavior actually defines how you're going to interact with the DUT, whether it's through configuration, the factory, or through sequences that generate transactions to communicate with the DUT. We've already seen in session two how the test can be used to tweak the factory and configuration settings, but a huge part of reuse comes from UVM's ability to encapsulate behavior in sequences. When combined with the factory and configuration, sequences let you specify different behaviors on a given test bench structure that still allow you to verify different aspects of the design functionality. Again, what we're really doing is decoupling the specification of stimulus from the structural hierarchy of the test bench. By being able to add, remove, or modify stimulus independent of the test bench, it allows us to provide a really simple API for the test writer. As we saw, on a given sequencer, you can have multiple sequences executing. A sequence generates a stream of transactions. You can have sequences executing in parallel. And you can have a sequence calling other sequences. So you might have a master sequence that starts an initialization sequence and then calls multiple sequences in parallel, and that might be the main part of your test. And then a cleanup sequence or something like that. So sequences can call other sequences. Sequences themselves, along with transactions, are customizable via the factory. So that's another way of reusing the structure that you have, but then using the test to modify the type of transaction that might get generated, or the type of initialization sequence that you run, or something like that. If we look at some of the basics of a sequence, we have a base type called UVM sequence that's parameterized by the type of transaction it executes. By default, it can do a request and a response that are of the same type. You can specify different types if you want. Typically, we just have a single transaction type, and we register the sequence with the factory using the object utils macro. We define other pieces of the sequence that might be necessary, including the transaction type that we're gonna be generating. And then we define the constructor. Note that we do not provide a default name in the constructor, since good coding practice dictates that the sequence will always be given a name when it is created. The body method is the task that actually defines the behavior that we're using to generate transactions. So the first thing that we might do is use the configuration database to get the number of transactions that we're going to generate or something like that. In this example, num will default to 10 as we saw, or the configuration database can override it. Then we create the transaction type that we're going to use. In this case, we call it request. Then we might go through a loop of generating transactions. For each transaction, we will call start item, which initiates the handshake for the driver. We'll see this in more detail in the coming slides. Notice that we're only creating one sequence item outside the loop and reusing it in each iteration. There's a performance trade-off to be made here. You may want each transaction to be different in each iteration of the loop, but there's a cost associated with creating new objects. As long as you're comfortable that your randomization of the transaction or other manipulation that you may do will sufficiently differentiate each transaction from the previous iteration, then reusing the object makes sense. Remember that through TLM, the driver will have a pointer to the same transaction. So we wanna make sure that the driver and any analysis components are either done with the transaction or have made a copy of it before we overwrite it in the next loop iteration. When start item returns, that means that the driver is ready to accept the transaction. At this point, we can randomize that transaction. We call this late randomization, since it allows us to randomize the transaction given the current state of the system when the driver is ready to accept the transaction. So we randomize the transaction when start item is complete, and we can add in additional constraints if we want using randomize with. If the randomization fails for some reason, we need to know about that as well. Notice that when we call one of these recording macros, UVM error info or whatever, we surround it with a begin end block. And that's because the macro itself is multiple statements. So we wanna be able to make sure that we keep that in a single branch of the if. 
Then we call finish item, which actually sends the transaction to the driver. So this is the basic structure of a sequence. Every sequence that you write is going to do something like this. So it's important that you understand this structure. We want to be able to create the transaction, call start item and finish item, and then around those we can do other things to enhance the behavior of the sequence. In order for the sequence, sequencer and driver to talk to each other, they must all be parameterized in the same way. The sequence requires two type parameters, one for the request type and one for the response type. By default, the response type is the same as the request type, so if you only specify one type parameter, they'll both use that type. Similarly, the driver also has request and response type parameters. These must be declared to be the same type as the sequence, and note that both the sequence and the driver are extended from base types in UVM. This is because each one, in addition to infrastructure support in the base class, will also require application-specific extensions for your particular application. Also, both the sequence and driver may be swapped out via the factory, so we need to register the extended types with the factory using the utils macro. For the sequence, we use object utils, and for the driver, we use component utils. The sequencer is a different story. Since all it does is execute the sequence, you won't have to worry about overriding it, but we still register it with the factory to ensure that it will show up when you print the hierarchy of your test bench. In some older UVM material, you may see the sequencer declared with a type def. Notice that the parameterization of the user-defined type must still match the sequence and the driver. Either way, you still refer to the sequencer type as my sequencer, but the type def wouldn't show up in the UVM hierarchy so we recommend you use the class declaration instead. The main job of a sequence, as we said, is to generate transactions and send them to the driver. So there's a handshake that occurs between the sequence and the driver. This handshake occurs within the sequence's body method and the driver's run phase method. In the sequence body method, we create the transaction and we call start item. Start item actually blocks until the driver calls get next item from its sequence item port. On the driver side, Get next item indicates that the driver is waiting for a transaction from the sequence and it allows start item to complete. The driver is still blocked in get next item until it actually receives the transaction. When start item returns, the sequence can randomize the transaction given the current state of the system. At this time, we're also free to do any other manipulation of the sequence item our application requires. We then call finish item from the sequence, which sends the transaction to the driver and allows get next item to return with the request object. The driver can then use that transaction object to drive the actual behavior onto the bus and any other operations you may need to do. When that transaction is done executing, we call item done in the sequence item port, and that indicates to the sequence that the driver has completed the transaction. Notice that we don't pass an argument to item done in this case, because either there may be no response required or it may be that the driver has filled in a response field of the original request object with the results of the transaction. When finish item returns, the sequence still has the handle to that same request, so we can then use that including any information based on the response that the driver may have filled into the request object. So we might call convert to string on it and print it out, or do some other thing in the sequence based on the response that came back from the driver. Optionally, though, the driver may take the request transaction and actually create a separate response object. In that case, the sequence needs to be synchronized with the driver in the sense that it knows that there's going to be a separate response. So after finish item, the sequence will call get response, which will block until the driver sends the response object. The driver, after it sends item done, will actually execute the transaction and fill in in the response object the ID info from the request. This is information that's built into the transaction in UVM that allows the sequencer to route the transaction back to the originating sequence. So after the driver sets up the response object with the ID information from the request object, it will explicitly call put response, which sends the response back to the sequence, and the sequence calls get response. Get response blocks until the driver actually calls put response, which is an optional part of the handshake. It's typically not necessary, and in the case of pipeline drivers or other things, it actually becomes a little bit problematic to be able to manage all that. But in a simple request response type of protocol, you can do this to actually send the response object back if you want. 
let's take a quick look at what happens in the sequencer. We know that sequences execute on sequencers, and we know that we can have multiple sequences running on the same sequencer. However, since there's only one driver, the sequencer has to decide which sequence to take the next transaction from. So there's arbitration built into the sequencer. The default arbitration scheme is first in, first out, but as we'll see in the next slide, you can choose others. Each sequence, when it executes start item, sends an arbitration request to the sequencer. The sequencer chooses which sequence to acknowledge, and then that sequence sends the transaction to the sequencer. In addition to the fields that you build into your sequence item, there are two fields that are built into the base class that the sequencer fills in for you. The sequence ID is assigned by the sequencer to each sequence, and within each sequence, each transaction is assigned a unique transaction ID. That way, every transaction is uniquely identified by the combination of its sequencer ID and transaction ID. With the ID information filled in, the transaction is then sent to the driver. The next sequence is acknowledged, and its transaction has its ID fields filled in, and then it gets sent to the driver. At this point, the driver is processing the two transactions and both sequences are waiting for responses. If the driver were simply filling in response fields of the original transaction, we wouldn't have to worry about the response path, but let's assume that there's a separate response object being sent back. In the driver, we need to call set ID info on the response object and pass it in the request object. This will copy the sequence and transaction ID fields from the request into the response so it can be routed back to the originating sequence. Then we put the response. The sequencer looks at the sequence ID to send the response back to the correct sequence. And that's the object that is passed into the get response method of the sequence. You also have the option of specifying a particular ID to the get response method, in which case the get response call will not return until a transaction with the matching transaction ID is returned. This is typically done in sequences in which fork joins are used to have multiple threads running concurrently, each one waiting for a particular transaction ID. Be careful though, because the response FIFO in the sequencer can only hold eight items at a time. If your sequence doesn't take one of those eight transactions out before the next response comes in from the driver, you'll get an error. You also have the option of writing your own response handler, though we don't recommend it. If you set use response handler to one, when the driver puts a response, the sequencer will call response handler, which is a method defined in the appropriate sequence. It's then up to you to take that response and do something with it. You can use it to increment a counter, print a message, send a copy somewhere, or whatever your application might require. You can also customize the arbitration of the sequencer in granting requests from multiple sequences, as we said. The default scheme is FIFO, but you can also choose weighted random, pure random, or FIFO or random according to the priority assigned when you start the sequence, as we'll see in a bit. You can also create your own arbitration scheme by choosing the seek arb user value of the argument. In order to use this, you have to extend the UVM sequencer base type and add your own user priority arbitration method. The argument to this method is a queue of available sequences from which you can choose. The default FIFO scheme simply returns the first sequence in the queue. Sequences are usually started in the run phase of the test. Before we can start it, we create it from the factory, and this will allow additional test extensions to override the type of sequence that gets generated if we choose to do so. After raising the phase objection, we call sequence.start, which is a blocking call, so it won't return until the sequence completes its execution. The argument to the start call is the path to the sequencer on which we want to execute the sequence. From the test, the path is typically environment.agent.sequencer. We can also start a sequence from the environment to have it behave kind of like a background or default sequence. We do pretty much the same thing we did in the test in the previous slide. First, we create the sequence from the factory so that the test can override the sequence type if desired. Note that we could also have the environment check a configuration parameter to decide whether to run the sequence or not. It's up to you how you want to control that. Just like from the test, we start the sequence on the sequencer. And notice that now the sequencer path is just agent.sequencer. The path to the sequencer is always relative to the component calling start. When the sequence completes, we drop the phase objection and we're done. 
Running a single sequence isn't always very useful, so you'll most likely want to run multiple sequences. In this example, we have an initialization sequence we want to run to set up the dot, and then there's an execution sequence that will be the main part of the test. But first, we create the init sequence from the factory. Then we create the exec sequence. We raise the phase objection. Then we start the init sequence. And then we start the exec sequence. And notice that since start is blocking, the exec sequence won't actually start until the init sequence completes. Once the exec sequence completes, we can do other stuff and then drop the objection to end the test. So this is how we run one sequence after another. We can also run sequences in parallel. In this test, we'll again create both sequences from the factory and raise the objection. But now, instead of calling start sequentially, we'll put the start calls in a fork join block. Notice that we don't use fork join none, because if we did, then we'd have to have some other mechanism to wait for completion before dropping the objection and ending the test. How you want to control the relative execution of sequences for your application is completely up to you. When you start sequences, particularly when you start them in parallel, you can specify an optional priority for the two sequences. If they're both trying to generate transactions at the same time, since there's only one driver connected to the sequencer, it needs to pick one of the two transactions to respond to, as we saw, and it will use the priority to determine which one to provide to the driver, depending on the arbitration scheme that you choose. We can also make sequences hierarchical. So we could create a test sequence that calls the two other sequences. We'll see in the next session how to manage this kind of thing across sequencers, but here we'll just look at how to control things on a single sequencer. Instead of declaring the init and exec sequences in the environment or the test, we're now going to declare them inside of our test sequence. So inside the test sequence's body method, we'll create the init sequence from the factory. When we start the init sequence, we'll use the argument msequencer, which is a built-in variable that is set to the sequencer on which test seek was actually started. So this start call will start the init sequence on the same sequencer on which test seek was started. The this argument is an optional parent specifier, so we can tell that init seek was actually started from another sequence. We can also create the exec sequence and start that on msequencer as well. The full hierarchical path to the exec sequence will be top.environment.agent.sequencer.testseek.eseq. You can see that the actual hierarchy of the sequences plays into the overall hierarchical name. So you can actually get to a specific sequence that's executing regardless of what the hierarchical organization is of the sequences. And if you know the hierarchical path to the sequence, you can use that path to configure the sequence directly using the config database. To support pipelining, a driver must be able to process a new sequence item from the sequence before the previous sequence item has completed. This will usually involve calling a task multiple times inside a fork join block where the number of task calls matches the stages in the pipeline. Inside that task, you'll have your sequence item and then probably a loop of some kind. If you use a forever loop, make sure you have some other way of terminating the task so your sequence doesn't hang. We'll use a semaphore to make sure that we only have one instance of the task accessing the driver at a time. Then we call seekItemPort.get to get the sequence item from the sequence. Notice that we're not using getNextItem here because get gives us a little more control. Then we do the command phase of our transaction on the driver. And when that completes, we release the semaphore so that the next thread can do the, its command phase. Then we execute the data phase, which is the next step in the pipeline the data phase will return a response object. Then when that completes, we call seekItemPort.put to send the response back to the sequence. OK, to summarize the general rules for sequences, the first step is to make sure that your sequence, sequencer, and driver are all parameterized to use the same request and response types. Remember that the response type defaults to the request type, so if you only specify one type parameter, they'll both be the same. We want to start sequences using sequence.start on a sequencer. In the previous session, we saw that we use start item to actually execute a transaction. To start a sequence, we call sequence.start on the sequencer. We typically use the get next item and item done calls on the sequence item port in the driver. 
Get next item is a blocking call so the driver will wait until the sequence actually has a transaction to send it. In some protocols this might be a problem, so if the driver needs to respond immediately on the bus even if no transaction is available, you can use try next item. This method will return in zero time, and if there's no transaction available, you can just have the driver do an idle cycle and try again on the next clock. Note that there's actually a delta cycle in the execution of try next item, but it is guaranteed to return at the same clock time. If you're using a pipeline driver, we recommend that you use get instead of get next item and put instead of item done. We use the config database to configure sequences. So sequences can use the configuration database to get information as to how many transactions to generate or whatever else might be necessary. And the name of the sequence can be used in the configuration database for the path and the instance name to generate the information. It's important to remember that the sequencer and the driver have to agree on a response path, if any. So if the driver is going to get information and stick it back into the originating transaction, the sequence needs to know that that's what's going to happen and that when finish item returns, that that transaction that was sent by the sequencer will now have information in it. If there's actually an explicit separate response path, then the sequence needs to know that and know to look in the response object for the information. As long as the sequence and the driver agree on what the response path is, everything will work fine. You just need to make sure that you sync those two up. That concludes this session on the proper care and feeding of sequences. Thank you very much for your attention, and please stay tuned for the next session, Layered Sequences.